Strong's View Christian Church. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me because He hath anointed me to preach good news to the poor. Um, there was a MS he has sent me to Lord, heal the brokenhearted and to preach deliverance. <laughs> To the cat, let no man deceive you. And recovering of sight to by the any blind, means, for the day shall not come, except there come a falling away first. Strong spiel, Christian church. We could do better. Welcome to Old Brooklyn Christian Church, soon to be. Strongville Christian Church. All right, amen. You guys blew my hair back, amen. That was good. Amen. The message that the Lord gave me today is forgiveness is the foundation. Forgiveness requires faith. Amen. Forgiveness requires faith. Not everything about forgiveness is uh, intellectual. It's not all psychology, uh, psychology. A lot of forgiveness, it requires faith. In fact, I would say the foundation of forgiveness requires faith. The Bible says that we are saved we are saved. Our salvation is by faith in Jesus. Amen. Amen. So without faith, we have no salvation. Not of good works, least any man should boast. So now we have forgiveness requires faith. So what I'm saying is that in order for us to enter into forgiveness, we have to first believe by faith that Jesus forgives us. Amen. And I'm going to tell you, if you're Mr. and Mrs. Goody Two-Shoes, it doesn't require as much faith. If you were yours truly, who used to do all kinds of stuff, which I don't have enough time to go into, it requires more faith because I did more sin. Does anybody see that? Amen. Amen. So you need faith to believe that Jesus forgives you. Amen. And then it takes faith to forgive other people. Because you realize that Jesus said that if you do not forgive others, your Father in heaven will not forgive you. Which means that forgiveness is conditional. Forgiveness is conditional. In other words, if you don't conditionally, if you, by the condition, don't forgive other people, then by that same condition, God does not forgive you. On the flip side, the condition is that through the condition that you forgive your brother and sister or your family, through that condition of forgiving them, then God forgives you. Amen? But my point is, is that forgiveness requires faith. And I got to say, I don't know that I'm the only person who said that, but I've never heard any sermon talk about uh, connecting faith to forgiveness. That's something that God had showed me when he put this message in my heart to share, is that forgiveness requires faith. Amen? So if some people have problems forgiving, then they have to ask themselves, do you have a problem with faith too? And a lot of times you're going to find out that there is a connection between their lack of faith and their lack of forgiveness. Amen. Amen. The two work together. Moving forward. Psalms 86.5. It says, For thou, Lord, art good and ready to forgive. Now, the fact that it says that God is good and he's ready to forgive, that implies that God knows that at some point in our life, we are going to mess up. That's what it implies. It does not insinuate or imply that God wants us to mess up. It does not insinuate and imply that God wants us to sin. But it simply knows that God is an all-knowing God and being a good God and a prophetic God, he knows that at some point in our life we are going to choose to sin and he has chosen to make a provision for that sin which is the fact that he is ready to forgive. And then it continues and says, and plenteous, which means a lot. He is not stingy. It says plenteous in mercy. Thank God for that. Thank God for that. God's mercy. Oh, I love his mercy. And I, I learned in life, we love his mercy even more when we mess up. 
Amen. When we're living good, oh, you know, I don't need so much mercy. But when you mess up, boy, that mercy feels good. And it says, it doesn't say that God is ready to forgive and is plenteous in forgiveness to everyone. You see that? It doesn't say, yeah, I forgive everyone no matter what. Even if they don't even repent and ask to be forgiven, I forgive them. It doesn't say any of that. Malarkey. Amen. Amen. Look at what it does say. It, again, goes back to a condition of the forgiveness. And it is not a deep condition. It is not a condition that is burdensome to anyone, but it requires faith. And look at what it says. It says that he's ready to forgive unto them. That's not to everyone, but to them. Who is them? Them are they that call upon him. You see that? He wants to forgive those that call upon him. But he can't forgive people who aren't calling upon him. And it requires faith to call upon him. But I got to tell you, when you muster up that faith, and you call upon him, and you receive that forgiveness and that mercy, it absolutely changes you. It changes you. I, I spent my, I would say, at this point, maybe half of my life uh, living in ignorance, thinking that God hated me, when it wasn't that he hated me, it was that he was hating what I was doing and the way that I was living and it's the fact that he hated the way I was living it was causing destruction towards my physical body my mental body my emotional body and my spiritual soul and that God had a better plan Amen. and I did not realize that God was waiting for me to call upon him and part of the reason why I did not call upon him is because I believed that God hated me because of my sin. And God simply wanted me to call upon him. To be forgiven for my sin. But I was never taught that. I didn't know that. I didn't grow up in a biblical Christian home. I grew up in a home where they did the best that they knew to do. When people experience our forgiveness... And love, it can change them. I cannot tell you how many times I've experienced this as a Christian. But again, you are not going to be used as a oracle of God to help change other people through forgiveness and love until you first receive that change and that forgiveness in your own life personally. And it is when you have that connection to Jesus Christ and you receive that healing and that washing and that cleansing of the blood of Jesus and that restoration and that new life and that eternal life that's flowing from you, that peace that passes all understanding, that joy that comes from God. It's until that you are connected to that that you are able to distribute that to other people. Now, I, I've seen people in the church, they, they have all types of gifts and talents, and they, are able, they know the word of God, they've been to church, but they are not expressing any type of mercy, any grace, any love. Nothing is flowing from them. Why? It's because they haven't received it themselves. And when you receive it yourself, you want to express it to other people. And I'll, I'll tell you, there have been people that I ran into that were just violent. Violent people, angry people. And there were some people that were scary people. And God told me to express some love to them. And I said, but God, they don't deserve it. And God said, neither did, neither did, neither did you. Amen. And I said, that's true. And I've expressed a reward to someone who was doing evil that I was personally afraid of. That was a violent person, a dangerous person, a person that other people were afraid of. And God said, that's the one that
that I want you to show some love to. And I did it to that person, and the person that I thought was going to attack me cried and confided in me. And I watched the change take place. And that is powerful. That is powerful. And I want to talk to you, church, today about forgiveness is the foundation. And you see an example right here. It says in 1 Samuel 24, 16, and it says, And it came to pass when David had made an end of speaking these words unto Saul, that Saul said, Is this thy voice, my son David? And Saul lifted up his voice and wept and said to David, Thou art more righteous than I. For thou hast rewarded me good, whereas I have rewarded thee evil. And basically, to summarize what was taking place, David was telling Saul that he had the upper hand in the situation. Saul had always been harassing David from the beginning of their relationship. He was throwing spears at him. Saul was in diso blatant disobedience of God. He was going to fortune tellers and psychics. He was doing things that he had no business doing. And, he was, and, and it even says in the Bible that the spirit of God had left him and God sent him an evil spirit. That's what it says. And you can see that he was gone. He was jealous. The, the women were praising David for killing tens and thousands. And they said uh, uh, Saul has killed hundreds, but David tens and thousands. So Saul had issues with jealousy. He had issues with anger. He had issues with insecurity. And he was lashing out on the person that was there to love him. And he was throwing these spears at him. And so after all that, Saul sent his captain, captives, his captains. Saul sent his captains to kill David. And David went hiding for his own life. And then after all that, logically speaking, rationally speaking, intellectually speaking, David had an opportunity to kill Saul. He caught Saul off guard. Saul was sleeping. He could have easily slit his throat and left. He could have killed him. The very person that was endangering the life of David and instead of killing him he took a piece of a remnant of his clothing as proof that he could have killed him and he explains all this to Saul you see that he explains it to Saul and in order for David to spare his life he had to forgive him. Do you see that? If, he, if, if David did not forgive Saul, he would have no doubt killed him. He would have killed him. But David said, even though he's done all these things to me, he said, God forbid I touch the Lord's anointed. See, that's a whole sermon in itself. David respected that Saul was chosen of God. He was a leader chosen of God. He had so much respect for that office, that position, that even though that leader was doing him so wrong, even then, he forgave. But I'm going to tell you, the world will tell you that forgiveness is in vain. The world will tell you that you should not... Uh, forgive other people for doing you wrong. But I'm going to tell you, that may be true without God, but in God, it is not true that when you forgive one another, you receive abundant blessings from God that you would have never received had you have never forgiven. And sometimes people don't receive these abundant uh, flow and connections and blessings from the windows of heaven because they're not forgiving. It cuts off what God wants to do. And after Saul heard these words of David, 
see, sometimes the devil, the enemy in your mind will make you think, well, you know, what I'm saying is not going to make a difference. What I'm saying, uh, they're not going to listen to me. I have no influence. No one cares what I say. No one cares what I do. I'm telling you, you don't know that. Every single person from the lowest to the top has influence over people. We all carry great influence. I be believe me, I'm telling you. We all carry great influence. Whether we're influencing folks for the good or for the bad, we are influencing one way or the other. And I'm going to take a little rabbit trail and I'm going to get back. And on that note, some people operate in sinful, ungodly activities, and they do it under the, the guise or the disguise or the excuse or the justification into saying that I'm not influencing anybody and no one's even paying attention to what I'm doing, so when I do this sin, it's not hurting other people. But it is. Every single thing we do, it influences other people. It does. Even if you do it in secret, it is influencing other people. And after Saul heard what David said, that he could have killed him, it pricked the heart of Saul. A man that the Bible says God left him. A man that the Bible says God sent him an evil spirit. Even with an evil spirit. Hear this church. Even with an evil spirit, David, through his mercy and his compassion and his forgiveness, it was able to change Saul. And immediately he changed his words. Look at what he said. He said, that Saul said, is this thy voice, my son David? Right there, you can see that his heart was influenced. And then he goes on and says, and Saul lifted up his voice and wept. And he said to David, thou art more righteous than I. For thou hast rewarded me with good, whereas I have rewarded thee with evil. You see that godly forgiveness and love, it changes people. You see that? It changes people. And I'm not saying this to you because I sat in some school and they taught me some academics. I'm saying this because I've seen it as an eyewitness. Godly forgiveness requires selflessness, not selfishness. This is a big, big one, folks. Very big one. Godly forgiveness requires selflessness, not selfishness. You see, if David was only thinking about himself, if David was selfish, do you really think he would have spared Saul when he had a chance to kill him? Even though he was trying to kill him. You see that? Folks that struggle with forgiveness it is more likely because they are selfish. And no doubt because they are in the flesh. They are over-identifying with their own self. And they are pity partying themselves. And they are struggling with an overflow of pride. See, selfish people are proud people. And selfish people that are proud are going to struggle and they are going to suffer from their own pride. They are going to suffer from their own selfishness. There is no good that comes out of living a selfish life. No good comes from that. Selfish people, proud people are the most 
unhappy, miserable people, which is why you have a lot of times in Hollywood a million billionaires with an abundance of money. They don't know what to do with it. They have all the cars they want. They have all the gold chains. They have the mansions, multiple houses all over the world. And then even in then, they kill themselves. Why do they kill themselves? Because they're selfish. They're living a life that's all about them. See, I found out that as a Christian and being connected to God and having the Holy Spirit, that when I'm going through the hardest times and, and people are doing me low down and dirty and people are disrespecting me and abandoning me and talking about me like a dog, I found out that my healing doesn't come from trying to solve all those problems. My healing comes from letting the Lord deal with those problems and going and helping other people that I have the power to help. And when I go into the prisons and the jails and I share the word of God and the love of God with them, I receive healing from them. You see that? And when I go into the nursing homes and I share with the elderly people who are dying and I share the word of God with them in the nursing home, then I, I, I all of a sudden I forget about them and I start looking at other people who have a worse situation than me and then they bless me. And that's why Jesus said if you visit those in hospitals and, and prisons, you visited me. And then by you visiting them, Jesus visits you. And then you realize that you're able to forgive them over here when you're no longer being selfish towards everyone else. Does anybody see that? Amen. Godly forgiveness requires selfishness. Selflessness. Not selfishness. And you see examples of this. It says in 1 Samuel 24, 18, it says, And thou hast showed this day how thou hast dealt with me. You see that David was no longer selfish towards Saul. He was selfless. It says, Thou hast showed this day how thou hast dealt with me for as much as when the Lord had delivered me into thine hand, Thou killedest me not. For if a man find his enemy, will he let him go well away? That's a rhetorical question. Saul's saying, who in the world finds his enemy and lets him leave? That's not logical. That's not tick for tat, eye for eye, tooth for tooth. That is a spiritual, by faith, unlogical, selfless character. You see, when we do what is expected to be do, done, that doesn't change people. But when you do something that is unheard of, that's what affects people. When you do something that's different, that's contrary, that is where we can see you are the remnant of God. You are a peculiar person. You are the priest of a holy nation. You are a child of God. That is when we see that you are a child of God and not a child of the devil. Amen. For if a man find his enemy, will he let him go well away? Wherefore, the Lord reward thee good for that thou hast done unto me this day. So now David went from Saul wanting to kill him, hating him, despising him. He went from wanting to take his life to now he got the approval of his enemy. The Bible says when a man's ways please the Lord, even his enemies will be at peace with him. Folks, I want, it's my heart's desire for you to experience these things. These things are not isolated and exclusive to just King David back then. God said, I'm the same yesterday, today, and forevermore. God wants us to experience these things in 2020. And when you see it, it's beautiful. But let me encourage you with this. When you don't see it happen in your timing, don't be discouraged. 
when you don't see things happening in your convenience the way you want, when you want, don't be discouraged. God has an appropriate timing to perform his masterpiece in your life. And it requires faith on our part, self-control on our part, self-discipline on our part, and patience. Patience, which is a fruit of the Holy Spirit. People know we're called to be leaders in the church by our forgiveness. Now, it wasn't my intentions to insinuate that when I say we're called to be leaders in church, I'm not talking about a title. Because you can have all the titles you want and still not be a leader. I'm talking about being someone that's going to be looked up to as a Christian. People know we're called to be leaders in the church by our forgiveness. In Saul 24, 20, we see an example. It says, and now behold, I know well that thou shalt surely be a king. You see that it was not through David's good looks, although the Bible says that he was comely, which means he was handsome. It wasn't through his, uh, his, uh, his rough and rugged, his toughness, the fact that he killed thousands of people that caused the approval of Saul. It wasn't that he was skilled with the, the, the harp and his music, musical talents that caused the approval of Saul. It wasn't through the sharpness and the accuracy of his sword that he was able to kill the enemies of the people of God that caused the approval of Paul, Saul. It wasn't through his academics and his intelligence. It's through none of that. It was simply through the foundation of forgiveness that caused him to receive the approval of Saul. And not only approval of Saul, but a blessing from his enemy. I'll tell you, you expect to receive blessings from your friends and family. Amen. You expect that. And that you should take with a grain of salt because that's what they're there to do. But when you start to receive the approval of the enemies, you see, I always say that my greatest compliment doesn't come from people in the church. It doesn't even come from my friends and family. My greatest compliment when I go to the jail and a Muslim comes to the church service and says, look, I am not a Christian. I don't want to be a Christian. I don't believe like you, but I enjoyed coming to the church service. It blessed me. You see that? When you start to get the approval of the people that are opposite of you, that's where you know that you are really being effective. And that's what happened with David. He won the approval of Saul and the Bible says that God is no respecter of persons. And the same way that David was able to approve the, 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 receive the approval of uh, Saul is the same way that you all, y'all, the church, can receive approval from y'all enemies through forgiveness, folks. Through forgiveness. He said, I know well that thou sure, shalt surely be king and that the kingdom of Israel shall be established in thine hand. Swear now therefore unto me by the Lord that thou will not cut off my seed after me. So now Saul started, because he started seeing God operating in David, now Saul started to fear David. But again, he did not fear David from all the people that he killed. Do you see that? He feared David because he saw David was connected to God. And sometimes you can't see who's connected to God until you first forgive them. See, Saul could not see that David was connected to God and he tried to kill him. He was always a child of God, but he couldn't see it because his unforgiveness blocked him from seeing that he was a child of God. Thank you, Holy Spirit. He could not see 
who David was because of his unforgiveness. There are some people in your life that cannot see who you are because of their unforgiveness towards you. Strongsville Christian Church, the Spirit of the Lord is upon me because He hath anointed me to preach good news to the poor. Um, there was a MS he has sent me to Lord, heal the brokenhearted and to preach deliverance. To the cat, let no man deceive you. And recovering of sight to by the any blind, means, for the day shall not come the except liberty, there come a falling away first. Strong's Christian Church.